So yeah, this is going to be one of those strange podcasts. I was actually on the motorway and I got a call from Ben Greenfield. I'm supposed to be here. So I pulled over to a service station. So we're finally here. Ben, it's be an absolute pleasure to talk to you. And I think we had a conversation going back many years ago. I'm not sure if you remember. This time I'm joined by Daniel Paulson, who is Oxygen Advantage from Sweden. So welcome, Ben. I think we're going to have a good conversation. Well, I hope you're going to be able to pump some gas at the service station during a conversation <laughs> to do something useful over there. Yeah, it's all good things. This is how, you just know, don't, just don't, don't, don't smoke a cigarette. I've heard <laughs> bad things happen. Life is all stations. about life is all about the ups and downs and about being able to react to different things. So that was one of those situations. See, this is it, Ben. You know, we've always been talking about changing states and regulating states. And what better gift than that? In other words, don't panic in the in the face of chaos. That's right. You probably smoke cigarettes through your nose anyways. <laughs> so how are you? I'm good. Good, good. 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 Yeah. And in terms of, I'd love to get an insight, just where are you at now? What are you doing? And how do you see that everything is happening in terms of health? And what do you think are they going to be the biggest game changers? And what things to watch out for? So I'd love to get inside your mind. And I'd love to know where breathing is in that as well. Jeez, that was like six questions. Um, well, ac acutely, I'm out on a walk right now in the sunshine by my property up here in Washington State. And I guess from a more long-term standpoint, uh, I see I see health essentially becoming more customized and personalized. I'm increasingly blown away by the amount of, of, of data being collected, personalized data being collected, not necessarily by insurance companies because a lot of that's so private, but a lot of public and private healthcare companies gaining access to massive amounts of information on genetic biomarkers associated with disease or certain protein expressions, um, along with algorithms that you know, actually draw good correlations between things like, you know, ApoB and stable versus unstable plaque in the heart, um, tumor expression via things like MRI screenings, um, a lot of big data based around blood work. And, you know, it's, it's, I, I'm pretty excited. Even, even with AI algorithms, you know, the amount of predictive data that they can now produce on things like cardiovascular risk potential based on a few simple screenings are just mind blowing. So I think we're kind of like a, a 20th century model of, of treating disease to a, to a much more forward thinking model of very smart prevention using actionable data and big data combined with, with uh, diagnostics and quantification. And so, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited about what's going on with health and the increasing affordability of the type of things that would have cost you know, tens of thousands of dollars, you know, a decade ago, and, you know, we're only available to executives, you know, I think we're going to continuously see that those same modalities are not only available to people, uh, but available to people in their own home with their own tracking devices. You know, we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg with continuous glucose monitors, but I think we're going to get a lot more than that. We're going to get continuous endocrine system monitors and continuous blood pressure monitors and you know, probably eventually the ability to do things like your own calcium scan score or your own plaque score or your own genetic evaluation via just like your saliva and a phone dongle. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. You know, I, I think there are upsides and downsides to technology and to an increasingly digital area. But I think when it comes to healthcare, um, besides the potential for a touch of over-treatment, which if we set things up correctly and intelligently can be avoided, I think that uh, that the, the pros outweigh the cons of where we're going with technology and healthcare, particularly. And I'll just ask one question before I'm sure Daniel wants to come in. So the technology is going to give us some guidance and predict and tell us what's going wrong. But the treatment is not likely to change, is it? So, for example, if somebody has high, high, got high cholesterol, the typical metal model is to put them on statins. 
if they've got anxiety, there's a medical model there. If there's sleep apnea, the gold standard of treatment is the CPAP machine. For children, it's tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy. And there's a lot of flaws that I would say um, starting off. And sometimes the most basic things have been overlooked. So you're talking about the predictive ability of high tech. But what about the treatment when people find that something is going wrong? Where do you see that going? Well, that's that's like a $4 trillion problem because when you, when you look at the size of the pharmaceutical industry and how intertwined things like pharma is with physician education, it definitely is an uphill battle to overcome the old school model of primarily identifying a problem once it arises and treating it with a medication or a biochemical solution versus identifying a problem before it arises and proactively preventing that from occurring in the first place. Now, I think that when you, when you look at a lot of the preventive modalities, such as lifestyle and exercise and diet and you know a, a few other modifications that are pretty simple from a preventive standpoint, look, I, I don't think that it's any secret anymore that that's a very effective healthcare modality. And you have very public figures now, you know, folks like, I don't know, you know Andrew Huberman or Peter Atti, David Sinclair, or, or a lot of notable people who actually have credentials who aren't necessarily like, you know, dirty hippies championing some, you know, $5,000 ancient Ayurvedic or 5,000 year old ancient Ayurvedic practice, but they're actually respected in their fields. And I, I feel like there's a shift change really. And, you know, maybe I'm biased because a lot of my conversations are occurring within the silo of functional medicine or at health conferences with a real focus on preventive medicine or age reversal strategies, et cetera. But, you know, when I look around me, it's not just my peers talking about the benefits of a preventive approach and a non-pharmaceutical driven approach, but I'm seeing the average person now talking about these types of things. I, I think that things are changing, honestly. Yeah. A, qu a question is then, do you think that if there's a lot of privacy issues that maybe in sports, they could lead uh, this uh, uh, issue because in sports, they kind of own the, their athletes a little bit more in, in team sports. So they can take all these tests and get a lot of data over time versus uh, versus in companies. What do you think? Uh, what do you think? Uh, do you think they could lead the way in that aspect? No, not really. I, I think that if you look at team sports, they're kind of a ripple in the pond compared to larger health care companies or potentially even insurance companies as far as the amount of big data that are being harnessed in untrained, unathletic populations or people who don't fit into that area that's far outside the parabolic curve of, of disease or aging. So I think that what we'll instead see are a lot of private lab testing companies who are doing a lot of the initial quantification. I think we'll see a lot of private healthcare companies, including physician practitioner networks and potentially even insurance companies being able to share data and act on that data. I think that the sports and, and the athletic market is a little bit of a, it's a little bit of a fringe outlier. And while there's good data to be had from that, I think most of it's really only applicable to, athletes just because you know you can look at something as simple as like you know the effect of a macronutrient ratio on the endocrine system or on diabetes or risk for obesity it's obviously gonna be far different in a you know football player you know practicing and training for you know three and a half hours a day versus the average person exercising you know for for say 30 minutes a day at best so yeah, I think we can get some information from the athletic and sporting industry, but I don't, I don't think it's that applicable or as big as the data that we can get elsewhere. So I wonder, the question here is, what's going to measure the data? Like, is, is it going to be Apple that's going to drive this? Is it going to be Google? It's going to be one of the big players. And is it going to be one instrument? Or is there going to be a requirement that you're wearing, you have an aura ring on, you've got a hoop band on, you've got Hanu Health on, you've got Leaf, you've got a whole range of things going on. Where is the commercial aspect in terms of it? Oh, well, I mean, you know, at least in America, monopolies are illegal. And 
So, you know, just from a pure capitalism standpoint, I think that there will always be multiple technology plays for things like self self quantification. You know, sure, Microsoft and Apple and some of these other companies will be the big players. They'll acquire some smaller companies, maybe the Aura, you know, the, the Hanu, like you mentioned, and you know, the, the Whoops will likely get swallowed up by a few large players. But I don't think we'll ever have a monopoly on the quantification piece. And then from a biochemical standpoint, you could really say the same thing. There's healthy competition in a lot of these laboratory testing services and also practitioner-based networks. And I, I don't really see America, at least anytime soon, going in the direction of uh, universal health care or universal diagnostics and quantification. So I, I think it'll still be spread out. Um, I also don't think we'll ever have a Star Trek-like device that measures everything just because there's there, there's there's a lot of issues as far as the ability of diagnostic tools to be able to measure, let's say, you know, hydrophilic versus hydrophobic compounds or, you know, the, the Dalton size of certain molecules is going to affect their ability to be able to be tracked and, and measured and detected. But, you know, I, I, I could at least see a future where we've got a device that, that gives you a lot of what you get from a basic blood panel, you know, like, like your lipid and your CBC and your metabolic panel, et cetera. And then, you know, possibly anywhere from, you know, four to five additional devices that might be able to collect, you know, hormone information, saliva information, you know, stool information, et cetera. And the medicine cabin of the future might be in someone's home where you simply have access to a few small diagnostic tools that you can, you know, then tie to an app on your phone, for example. And then those are going to be still separate from some of the HRV and the sleep trackers, et cetera. But I, I don't really ever see there being a monopoly in all of it. What, going back to that question is, uh, that Patrick asked, where do you see, if any, a breathing's role in this? And, and the, the last couple of years where breeding has taken off a little bit, where do you see uh, breeding taking part, part of this? Because I know you've done quite a I've read your book Beyond Training and uh, a lot of your podcasts, and I see that you're, you've, you've done quite a bit of breeding yourself. Yeah, I, I think that three modalities like breathing or sunshine or movement or grounding or earthing or even arguably like cold and heat will uh, the, the, they'll, they'll always be some resistance to their adoption on a widespread basis just because of the fact that they're they're difficult to monetize and mm. you know cat capitalist motivations typically drive you know deep penetration into a consumer market uh, but at the same time there's a lot of people talking about breath work in the same way there's a lot of people talking about say like heat modalities cold modalities etc so i i mean i've i've seen you guys probably have seen too you know this steep rise in breath work apps breathwork knowledge. Um, I'm, I'm one of those slow growth, slow burning log type of guys. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not necessarily the, the, you know, tent revival come to Jesus moment, you know, just a massive wildfire spread of some knowledge or some trend versus a slow build. And the slow build typically occurs on the cultural or the educational level. What I mean by that is, you know, and I've, I've talked about this for years, so I think a core part of any young human's education should be a breath mastery and the ability to be able to use it to tune up or tune down the nervous system or engage in certain modalities appropriate for performance or for recovery. And so I think really the low-hanging fruit for breath work is that somebody, maybe you guys, I don't know, creates a, an actual curriculum to be adopted probably initially by the private schools, charter schools, home schools, et cetera. But I could eventually see something like that even be adopted on the government school level. And I think it starts with education. And that's really how you make deep penetrations into society, you know, for better or worse. The way that you that you educate our elementary students, our high school students, and our college students is basically 20 years from now going to dictate the general trend of society in general. So I think that's where we need really a greater focus on breath work is on the educational level. Yeah, I agree. I, I think that we, we talked about that, Patrick, and yeah, so uh, it needs to get into schools, but it's uh, that takes time. It takes a lot of time. Um, but yeah, I agree. But it takes 
21 years, Ben. Um, we've been putting this out there for, and we just celebrated our 21st year two days ago on St. Patrick's Day. We launched an app which is containing about 70 different sequences of exercises, and it's free. I put $150,000 into it. And that's where I see the awareness is happening at the moment. And it's the same reason. Back in 2002, nobody wants to know about breathing. Nobody wants to know the intricacies of working with people with asthma, with sleep apnea, with anxiety, with panic disorder, and tailoring breathing according to, to the individual's makeup of the person. Breathing is powerful. It can go one way or it can go the other way. So in terms of the awareness, I think it's happening. It's quite slow. I would totally agree with you. But I actually think the last three to four years have been a monumental shift forward. Um, and especially, I suppose, with technology around heart rate variability and everything else. So, yeah, hopefully, hopefully it's here to stay. And I think it is. Um, if you were asked, what are the two most fundamental areas in terms of breathing? What would you say, like, what are the two biggest game changers that breathing can offer somebody? Oh, well, it's difficult to pick two, as you probably know. But for me personally, and, you know, my, my sons and I, they're, they're 15 years old as of yesterday. And we do a lot of breath work together. And I think the two areas for which we find it most useful is either morning energy or later evening recovery or sleep. And that's probably when I use breath work the most, either in the sauna or in the backyard or sometimes in the cold, breathing in the morning for energy or on a plane or before a siesta or going to bed or relaxation and recovery. And I suppose for me personally, uh, as, as a, a spiritual and religious man, I certainly tie breath work quite a bit to my spiritual practice, which I would kind of lump possibly into like the rest, recovery, sleep, de-stressing type of category. But, you know, when it comes to, gosh, I remember when I was competing in Ironman triathlon years ago and one of the best swimmers in in the entire field, uh, Andy, I'm blanking his last name, now it's Andy, and he just was known for just absolutely destroying everyone in the swim and coming out of the water sometimes like, two to four minutes ahead of the rest of the crowd in the, you know, in, in the race. And I remember he was up on stage giving a speech at one of the, one of the pre-race dinners. And he starts doing this wacky breath work. And this is like years before anybody knew who Wim Hof was or anything like that. And so, so he ends up there doing this wacky, like breath work. He's like, this is everything I do before the race. It's like, get my body ready. And I'm watching him like, that's amazing. So I started doing some of his stuff before I'd, I'd do my swims for Ironman, my swims for other triathlons. And it was amazing. It was almost like you didn't have to warm up for the swim. You know, you're already buffed acid and had good oxygenation and, and you know, had blown off CO2 and, and gone a little bit alkalinic before the race even began. And so uh, ba basically the, the performance implications, I think, are, are pretty astounding. And I actually uh, I, I know a few guys now who are basically getting asked to do consults with, you know, professional athletes and professional teams to teach them breath work and lead them through breath work and and so i don't think that's just a, a trend i think you know in the same way that let's say like heart rate variability is just kind of like no longer a weird metric for recovery but something that a lot of strength conditioning coaches now recognize and use i think that, that breath work's kind of catching on similarly and then for this and recovery component i think that's probably something that is already known a little bit more popular amongst a lot of people we just gotta get them to do it more and and spread that knowledge about you know a lot of the things i do you know four, seven, eight breathing or four, eight breathing or mouth taping or, or breath as prayer. You know, there, there's, there's a lot to be said for that too. So I would say, uh, you know, performance energy and focus in the earlier parts of the day and then rest, recovery, sleep and spirituality in the later part. Yeah, I, th I would definitely agree with you. And I think you're talking about 15 year olds um, replacing breathing with a screen or, or the opposite way around in terms of not having them watch and spend so much time looking into a screen all day and replacing it with something like breathing that can help to improve their concentration, attention and focus. Like I suppose we go to school, but we're not taught how to deal with stress. We go to school, we spend 13, 14 years in education. We're not taught how to concentrate. So I think there's something really amiss there. And I think breathing can fill that gap. Uh, the spiritual aspect is very interesting, and you, you're probably aware of the stuff by Bernardi, 
that when they looked at different prayers and yoga mantras, that it slowed down breathing to six breaths per minute. So there was a physiological aspect to it as well as a spiritual aspect to it. So, you know, we wouldn't always think of prayer in that context, but they, they do go hand in hand. Yeah, they seem to. I mean, if you look at a lot of the early, uh, you know, desert mothers and church mothers, um, you know, tied back primarily to, to Eastern Orthodox and the Orthodox branch of Christianity, uh, there was a great deal of yoking breath to prayer that later carried on into a lot of the ascetic monk practices. And, you know, perhaps most well-known or most popular in religious circles is the classic Jesus prayer. You know, O Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner, with O Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, being the inhale mantra, and have mercy on me, a sinner, being the exhale mantra. And that's something that, you know, in, in Orthodox circles, it's often tied to breath and performed 100 or more times a day and used for temptation and for stress and for sleep and for times of need and comfort or mourning. And so, uh, you know, I, I really didn't begin of tying breath work into prayer until just a couple of years ago. And there, there actually is something nearly magical, which I suppose if, if you're a religious or spiritual person, you, you, uh, you kind of have to believe in magic because you believe in the supernatural. But there's something magical or supernatural about what happens after about five to ten minutes of reciting a prayer like that. You almost feel a spiritual entity in the room. Or in the case of the Jesus prayer, you almost feel or sense the presence of a deity in the room. It's really difficult to explain, but... There's, there's something about it. And perhaps it's, you know, if you, you know, if, if you're a religious person and you read or believe the Bible, you know, you can certainly find early in the Bible in Genesis, you know, there's a breath of life breathing to the first human, uh, interestingly through the nostrils. And that breath of life is, is what sparks life. And, you know, God is often referred to as moving in the wind. And a lot of the Hebrew words that describe God's movement and God's activity, are related to that concept of prana. And so there's something about the wind appropriately enough. You guys probably hear the wind blowing into my headphones right now as I'm walking. Uh, and, and the breath that, 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 that seems to tie really, really well to the spiritual world. And then of course, if you use the breath to, you know, do a little bit more kind of holotropic or DMTS type of activities, I don't know many people who have not done you know, 30, 60, 90 minutes of breathing and not had a deeply spiritual experience. And I think that's more than just patterns and, and molecules and dimethyltryptamine from a pineal gland. I, I think you actually are crossing a little bit of a spiritual threshold when you use your breath in that manner. And I think it can be even more powerful than, you know, meditation by itself or, or prayer by itself. Well, I would agree. And I suppose it depends on our definition of spirituality other than being connected with life and and in presence, you know, and how many of us are in presence now or how many of us are stuck in our heads? We're not necessarily seeing what's going on around us. We're not collecting with the connecting with life around us. We can do it through the breath. So I think there's a difference between spirituality and, and religion. Um, and for those people, you know, spirituality can be a tremendous gateway to help bring a stillness and a quietness to the mind, especially with the ups and downs of daily life. And I think we all need it. And the, the breath could be a gateway there, I would agree. Daniel, you want to jump in? Yeah, well, I, I just want to listen to you, Ben. It seems like uh, I have to say that uh, even though Patrick asked for two, two, uh, two uh, uh, ways that you use breath work, it seems like it's a very integrated in your life. Very, And that's kind of what I'm looking for always, that it's not, not just uh, on the yoga mat or just for your athletic performance or just for sleep, but it's all over the place, really, in every because uh, it's always with you. And that's the I think that's the unique thing about breathing, that you always carry it with you and you can use it in e every facet of your life. And it sounds like that's what you're doing. Uh, I want to hear you speak about it. Yeah. So, I mean, if you start to add it up, it certainly is, you know, woven into my own life now and in a pretty fashion, meaning my morning devotion and time with God includes breath work. And then when I meet with the family for our family meditation later on in the morning around 7.30 or 8, we're yoking that to our breath. And then later on, before breakfast, before lunch, and before dinner, you know, it's always at least one deep breath 
nose and out through the mouth for the parasympathetic nervous system activation and to prepare the body to receive food. And then typically at some point, either before or after my workout or both, I'm either using some kind of a breath resistance device or focusing on nasal breathing or doing some type of breath work for a warm up or for a cool down. And then later on in the day, typically sometime between like 5 and 6.30 p.m. before dinner, my sons and I almost every day do 15 minutes up to 45 minutes of breath work in the sauna. And those are a lot of kind of apnea based sessions for, you know, working on breath hold and and uh, diaphragmatic and inspiratory and expiratory muscle training and some of the stuff we're doing, uh, for example, right now to prepare for a, a free diving and spearfishing trip that we have in a little bit. But I also do it just to basically train my sons how to use their nervous systems. And then it's into the cold pool afterwards where there's typically some element of box breathing. And then we're off to dinner where there's more breathing before dinner. And then we have our, our evening bedtime stories and songs. And then my wife and I say a prayer and I'm breathing myself to sleep with either, you know, four, seven, eight breathing or four, eight breathing or uh, something like the Jesus prayer, uh, most often taped. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it, not, not an hour can go by during the day where there's not some element of breath besides just the unconscious pattern of breathing to survive, you know? Have you, do you, uh, how, how important is it for you to measure the effects, uh, uh, like for instance, uh, all the all the different things you mentioned, such as glucose or heart rate variability, uh, because uh, I know from ex for example doing cold bath and and uh, ice bath and and uh, breathing techniques is a fantastic uh, accelerator for heart rate variability. Do you use that a lot, or you, did you used to do it when you started out doing it? Yeah, I mean, like I, I, I wear an aura ring, so kind of everything is quantified in the background, even though it's typically in airplane mode. So I'm rarely checking it. You know, occasionally when I'm at my uh, at my office, you know, I'm using Hanu. Um, you know, I use a continuous blood glucose monitor for about two weeks every couple months just to check on how my body is responding to my diet. You know, I typically get a big quarterly blood panel, hormone panel, you know, stool panel, etc. Uh, one once a quarter. And, um, you know, then occasionally just do one-off tests, whether it's our arterial flow measurements or some type of a lab workup, like an MRI or a CT scan of the heart or something like that. And that's typically annually. So, yeah, there's a lot of quantification that goes on, but it's pretty rare that I'm just like in real time paying attention to what's occurring while I'm breathing or, you know, um, you know, obsessing over sleep data every morning. Like typically when I start to pay attention to data is when something seems like it might be going wrong like i've got the sniffles or i'm having poor sleep or i'm hungry all the time or you know i'm i feel like i'm not able to hold my breath as long that's when i'll start to dig into the data and you know look at things like okay well, what's going on with my my oxygen saturation at night or what do my rbcs look like or my hemoglobin saturation or you know you know is my vitamin d falling this winter you know etc but um i i don't really do as much kind of like obsessive self quantification as I guess a lot of, of biohackers who, who do that. And I think part of it for me is like, you know, you can only spend so much time quantifying uh, to where you're, you're not really, really doing the work. You know, mm -hmm. I'd rather spend, you know, 40 minutes running than 30 minutes running and 10 minutes reviewing the data for the run, you know? Yeah. Well, one question is where, where do you, do you have a preference in, if you're ever if you're ever in a high pressure situation like real time because that's where I think also breathing is unique to shift your state when things are going well it is high pressure uh, you have a limited amount of time you don't have 10 or 15 minutes maybe just uh, like for an athlete maybe just uh, 30 seconds to a minute or before a presentation or something like that do you have a go-to protocol for actually changing states in a very limited time Typically, if I need to change my state rapidly, it's because I'm about to do something I'm nervous about. And absolutely, for, for me, that's either long exhales or box breathing. And it's pretty yeah. rare that I actually find a, a need to do it versus I'm doing it to like fall asleep or, you know, for a longer period of time. Um, you know, like <laughs> I had a three hour plane flight last night, right? So I did literally like 
20 minutes of four count in, eight count out with a little bit of white noise in the background. Uh, and then I woke up and the plane was landing, you know. And so, you know, if I have a longer lead in time, I can literally just like breathe myself to rest and relaxation about anywhere. But for, yeah, for those shorter, more acute efforts, you guys know this, you know, just a four count in, eight count out one time can settle you or one round of box breathing can do the trick. But for me, it's pretty few and far between. Like if I'm going to step on stage in front of a whole bunch of people or, you know, a difficult crowd or, you know, occasionally when something goes really wrong, which seems to be like, you know, during travel, whatever, you forgot your driver's license or your passport and you start freaking out and you remind yourself to breathe. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not that often that, that I got to pull it out in an acute setting. Cause I'm really not competing much, you know, it, like professionally in, you know, endurance sports or anything like that. So I'm really not having to do it, you know, on, on the starting line of a race or anything like that. So I'm really not in as many high pressure situations. Thank God. Yeah, it's, I think it's amazing, you know, what you're talking about, the ability to self-regulate is absolutely so vitally important, Ben. And the question to put it out there is, if if people knew about this, what would it do to their anxiety, to depression, um, to a lot of the issues that are associated with panic disorder and ADD, ADHD, well, I don't, I don't, I don't, think, so I don't think that's a question. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that's a question. I mean, it's been studied. There's even studies that have shown that, you know, not that I'm a fan of antidepressants, but SSRI uh, efficacy increases in people who pair and yoke a breathwork practice to the use of antidepressants. And, of course, we know about pain management and anxiety modulation and, of course, vast amounts of data on blood pressure regulation and cortisol regulation. So, yeah, it, it's very interesting that, you know, may, may we come back to the four trillion dollar problem I was talking about earlier. You know, the data is out there, but it's not being widely disseminated because it's not very profitable. You know, but I think there's another aspect of it as well. I think breathing has been held back because it's seen very left of field. You know, like if you put in any Google search of meditation and breathing, you'll typically see some guy up in the Himalayas. Um, yeah, you, you know, and that can put off a lot of people. And that's not what breathing is about. Breathing is very much, as you know, you know, there's a lot of science behind it, even though, of course, not everything is known about it. Um, it needs to be taken into the middle of the field and it needs to be for the people. It's not going to be left of field and nor should it be solely right of field, but it should be available there. And yeah, it's, I would like to see it. I know James Nestor's book has really pushed it and which has yeah. been tremendous you know and that's what we need we need more breaks like that and even yoga I'm, I'm currently completing a book on breathing for yoga and if i was to look at 10 yoga instructors on youtube which are doing tremendous work and putting out great videos very often i don't think there's an understanding of the potential of breathing from a number of different dimensions in terms of the biochemistry it's not all about taking the full big breaths um, carbon dioxide also yeah. plays a, a very important role. So I think we still have some way to go. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, just just imagine my life, you know, because I'm a Christian, right? And so I'll sometimes, like, tell my Christian friends I'm doing breath work, and they look at me like I'm some kind of a hippie pantheistic pagan, you know, <laughs> like wor worshiping nature and, you know, I don't know, having <laughs> at Burning Man or something. And it's like, dude, this is like – a really, really good way to connect to self and connect to God and modulate your nervous system. And it's this free, amazing, you know, nearly supernatural tool that God built into us. Like how, how could you like deny the, the, the importance and efficacy of something like an intimate connection to your breath? So yeah, even okay. religion in religious circles, it's very, very interesting. There's like this, like, you know, it, it hex around breath work that it must be some like pathway to the devil's playground, like taking a heroic dose of psilocybin or something. <laughs> how how would you how how would you uh, like uh, there's a integrate this if you or start a habit if you were new to breathing because uh, most people will be more or less breathing how would you start would you start slowly or would you completely integrate it to everything in their life or would it be tailor made or do you have any any um, preference in that how you actually build the habit. Well, I mean, when I describe my day, you could tell someone, hey, take a deep breath before breakfast, before lunch, before dinner. You know, if you're doing any type of prayer meditation in any ways in the morning, bring breath work into that and then like breathe yourself to sleep and do, you know, 
a certain type of breath work before you exercise. Uh, but um, I think people need a little bit more hand holding than that. And honestly, like nine times out of 10, I recommend do breath work who stick to it. I'm just recommending some kind of like an app, you know, and a lot of these apps nowadays, they'll have like challenges or they'll pop up and have notifications that remind you to do your breath work session for the day. And you can choose how long it'll last. I mean, not to sound like a total tech head because you obviously don't need an app to breathe, but I honestly, I use, I use apps a ton. Like I, I could do my own self-guided breathing, but it's kind of fun to have somebody else, you know, somebody else's voice, somebody else counting some kind of music, you know, some kind of session kind of put together for you. It's like going to the gym, right? Like you can go do it on your own, but it's, it's a hell of a lot more fun when, you know, you got a personal trainer bringing you through everything. And honestly, the fact that most of these apps are like dirt cheaper dictates that I think that's one of the best ways to get somebody on the breathwork bandwagon. Cause most people, for better or worse, kind of already have a phone in their pocket, you know? Hey, hey Ben, the best breathing app out there is Oxygen Advantage. And, uh, yeah, I'd love you to be shouting it from the tree tr- treetops. And it's free. I, I, it's I didn't even know you had free. one. Yeah, we just launched yeah, it about two weeks one. ago. Um, it was how, kind of- how are you? Uh, so, like, I, I don't know. I'm like, I'm an entrepreneur, so I got to ask this question. Like, how are, you, how are you, like, paying for the app? How are you monetizing it? I'm not, are you? and I don't intend to, uh-huh. and I never want to. And the reason being is because I want to drive awareness. I see yeah. we have still a massive way to go. And like, I'm comfortable, like everything is going well. And I, you know, I'm 20 years in this field and it's been a long, long journey. And, you know, there's a certain yeah. stage in your life. You'd love to see it hurry up a little bit. I think the app could be that gateway there. People aren't reading books as, ma- as much as they were in the past. Very, very often they're looking into screens and we have to take advantage of that. And I think there's also another thing is there are people putting out apps and different things about breathing, but they have never actually worked with anybody in terms of breathing. They uh-huh. haven't brought somebody through panic disorder or through asthma yeah. or with sleep apnea. So, you know, I think it's important to tailor it according to the specific. And that's what we did. So, yeah, so the app is out there. We never intend to uh, put a subscription. I'll have to go check it out. I, I didn't know you had an app, but I guess I kind of threw you a softball there. <laughs> and, yeah, and that would be that, super. Now you, can, now you can listen to yourself when you do your own breathing, Patrick. You, listen, you can listen uh, to yourself. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's, that's narcissistic. Right <laughs> so, Daniel, we only have a few minutes because Ben has a hard stop. So the last yep. couple of well, questions. Uh, well, basically, uh, I, I, well, I know you actually uh, have a bunch of questions, so I'll just finish off with you. Um, you, I, I guess you, you play tennis in college, Ben. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't amazing, but I did, I did play. Now I play pickleball though. <laughs> yeah. 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 I play, I play college in tennis. I mean, in college as well. So probably a few years before you did, but uh, I think for, for tennis, in general, I think this would be, if I could have gone back for tennis, this would have been, I didn't know about breathing back then. A fantastic oh, yeah. Tool. I mean, yeah. Tool. Tennis, golf. I mean, now I shoot, you know, because I bow hunt. And so, you know, I'll use it when I'm shooting. I, I actually tie, I didn't even mention that during my daily routine, but it's part of my shooting practice as well. But yeah, if I had known about it during tennis, man, like I would have been able to ice the nerves so much more efficiently. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I, I really do. I mean, a, any type of sport, but tennis is a, is really a thinking sport as well, and it's and it's also a, a, a pattern of twenty five seconds in between points, in between changeovers. So you can actually you can use that very repetitively. So I think it's one of those sports that uh, I'm working with some tennis players that has you know should really get into uh, breathing. Uh, but it goes for all sports really. But um, so. So that, that was that was basically yeah. it, Patrick. So Ben, <laughs> in terms of your shooting, because I, I always feel this is interesting, but the last time I spoke about this, somebody complained. We were working with snipers and we were teaching them how to breathe while pulling the trigger of a gun. We got a dreadful email in from somebody. Um, but I think it comes down to this. I would much rather see military and, and police personnel being taught breathing exercise to self-regulate. They're less likely to make mistakes. They're less likely to use little force. And maybe teaching snipers and people how to breathe while pulling the trigger is a gateway into that. What way do you typically breathe when you are pulling the trigger? And I'm assuming when you're talking about shooting, oh, yeah. it's it's a gun. Yeah, that's that's pretty straightforward. No, it's a bow. You know, I, I do have some firearms, but I don't I don't do a lot of shooting with my firearms, just enough to be able to responsibly use them should I need to. 
but the the bow is my primary method of hunting and that's it's very straightforward patrick i mean as you know the heart rate decreases during the exhale and so typically i'll have an inhale as i'm drawing which helps with the strength of the draw anyways you know because i'm drawing about 70 pounds and then typically there'll be a few light nasal breaths as i'm settling on the target and then i'll have a long exhale and at some point during that long exhale my finger is already wrapped around the trigger because at this point i shoot a, a trigger release and uh my focus is on my back arm and my rhomboids and at some point during about the oh eight to 12 seconds that i'm exhaling i'll actually release the shot because that's when my heart rate is of course slower and you know even that that tiny micro motion as you know of the beating of the heart can affect the, the release and of course the the level of anxiety can be reduced slightly during those yeah seconds yeah. on the exhale so that's that's how i do it so you're pulling the trigger between beats and if, if the time isn't right if it doesn't feel right to pull you wait for the next breath and you just do it again it's really interesting oh, isn't it how yeah, it ties in kind of huh? i mean but really like i'm not waiting to pull the trigger until the next breath because the way that you shoot a bow like you actually don't want to like think okay my pins on the the vitals or the bullseye now i pull the trigger you instead almost like want to surprise yourself. And most of the good are, oh, I haven't made this switch yet. They're actually using what's called a thumb release, which is activated by the tension in your back and not by you even pulling the trigger. So it's almost like a surprise when it goes off and your pins just kind of floating over where you want to float. And then it's a surprise when the release goes off. And I try and get as close to surprise as I can. Meaning like, like I mentioned, there'll be like eight to 12 seconds during that exhale where my finger is very lightly wrapped around the trigger my focus is on my back muscle elbow and then there's just kind of like a pop that occurs at some point and the arrow is released and I'm not thinking about pulling the trigger. So really there's not a thought going through my head. Like I'm going to wait till the next exhale. It's just like, all right, at some point in the next eight to 12 seconds, this arrow is going to fly. And I don't know exactly when that is, but that actually kind of keeps you from getting trigger panic. If that makes sense. It's kind of difficult to explain, but yeah. um, probably, probably the best example. I think that uh, another podcaster, uh, uh, Joe Rogan, uh, I think a while ago he interviewed Joel Turner and they had a fantastic discussion about what I'm trying to explain in brief. But, uh, but, but yeah, that's, that's kind of the idea behind it. Great stuff. Well, Ben, it's a pleasure. And I'd like to say thanks very much, even though I had a rocky start there all my fault. So that's, that's what happens. And Daniel. Thank you so much, Ben. Well, if you were in America, Patrick at a service station, you, I probably would have wished you to go inside and get get yourself a like a blue Slurpee to enjoy and a corn dog. I don't know what they have over there in Ireland. Probably not like much, I don't know, green, not much. Do you green want to have a, beer or something. You're gonna have a yeah. Look <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy your service station. Thanks, guys. I appreciate appreciate the discussion. Good stuff. Thanks, Take care. Okay. Bye. All right. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.